Hey everyone, this is season five of the Performance Nutrition Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Bubbs, and I'm excited to be kicking things off here in 2021 with my guest today, Dr. Marcus Hannon, the head of nutrition at Aston Villa Football Club in the English Premier League. In today's conversation, Marcus and I are going to be talking about his research in academy level youth football players, topics like total energy expenditure, resting metabolic rate, and how much fuel it really takes to support a young athlete's training and health. If you work with young athletes, you won't want to miss this episode. Enjoy. Marcus, thanks so much for taking the time today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mark, for, uh, for having me on. No problem at all. Listen, I think the best place to kick things off would be to, uh, you know, walk listeners through a little bit of your your background and how you got into uh, into performance nutrition. Yeah, so I guess... Um, Get from from the accent, you can probably tell I'm from Belfast uh, in, in Northern Ireland originally, um, and then the start of my journey um, from from a professional point of view is probably like most people, um, university. So, so I did my undergraduate um, at Oxford Brookes University um, and did a combined honours in nutrition and sports science, and um, so I got a nice blend of, of both the nutrition aspect on the sports science and sort of exercise physiology side of things nice and um, after that then i i went on to liverpool john Murray university um, and studied my master's in, in sport nutrition and, and i guess throughout those years throughout my undergraduate years and, and a bit of time off in between and, and during my master's i was i gathered experience you know shadowing volunteering um placements at university in, in different sports, so at football and rugby primarily, um, picked up bits of experience along the way in, in different sports, and that was with primarily academies and, and youth athletes. But I, I got some experience and, and um, insight to the, the adult populations as well. Um, and then once I finished up my masters, um, I stayed at, at John Murs to pursue a PhD. Um, under the supervision of uh, Professor James Morton, um, and that's what I would call sort of, and I did what I would call an applied PhD. So I was in, embedded um, into every football club where I did the academy um, nutrition. So so day to day, I was in the club overseeing the all academy age groups and, and nutrition support. Um, what was that like, uh, Marcus? If you don't mind me jumping in, what was that like when you first got on the boots on the ground there doing your uh, doing your work there and getting in with the with the youth squad like you know those initial impressions when you first jump in what was that if you could remember back yeah it was um i'd, I'd worked in most of my experience was probably in rugby and um, previously um so football you know i played i played little bits of football but primarily rugby growing up and um and i followed football so going from rugby into football it's, like, it's just such a bigger sport there's so much it's such a a bigger setup in terms of the facility, staff, everything. So, uh, you know, when I initially went in, it was like, right, um, when I started there, it was a bit of a blank canvas. There was no previous nutrition support um, within the academy there. Um, so it was blank blank canvas. I, I came in as a team myself, and there was uh, Lloyd Parker with the, the, the seniors, and, and Professor Graham Close actually was a consultant to us. So three of us were in blank canvas. And, yeah, it was, it was quite overwhelming at the start. And then within the academy, there was, you know, over 100 kids. So, um, <laughs> nice. yeah, we set up systems and strategy and, you know, we just we, we yeah. went for it. Nice. It's one of the beauties of having a blank slate as well, right? Yeah, it was awesome. It was a brilliant, brilliant opportunity to really put our stamp on it and, and roll things out the way we wanted to do it, um, which, which was brilliant. So, so yeah, I, I worked there day to day, and and alongside that, I did, I conducted my PhD research um, within the club as well. So I, I integrated some of that into my my day to day practice, and some sat on the side. But we we conducted the research within that population. So we used the academy players there, and we studied them, um, and that was awesome. I, I really really enjoyed that combined research practitioner role. Um, you know, the, the research that we collected informed our practice and, you know, influenced Sorry. practice. And yeah, it was brilliant. And, you know, I, I really think that's, um, for, for me, that's the way sports science, really applied sports science at work, you know, research and informing practice and, um, you know, to, to really stay on the cutting edge of things. I think that's where, where, you know, we all need to be. 
And it's such a nuanced area, isn't it, uh, Marcus? I mean, you're starting with with kids and adolescents, and there's all these extra variables that we don't, uh, you know, sometimes we think of kids as many adults, but obviously through your work, that's we've realized that's not the case. So, you know, when you, for, for people watching, wanting to learn a little bit more, like we obviously know that growth and maturation, I mean, that's incredibly complex time, you know, genes, hormones, environment, all these things are impacting. Can you walk us through some of the, you know, nutritional requirements for a younger athlete? Yeah, well, yeah. Um, so so it's, it's a good point. You know, you, you can't just consider these these guys or, or youth and youth or growing and developing athletes. You can't just look at them in the same way that you look at an adult athlete. They they obviously have their training and competition demands, just like the adult athlete. But they have the you know this growth and maturation process, um, which you know rapid biological growth and maturation can can happen over a period of, of time and. And during that time, there's there's rapid change, you know, from a anthropometric point of view, from a physiological yeah. point of view, from a metabolic point of view. So all these things combine and, and really influence the the nutritional requirements, um, you know, energy requirements, macronutrient requirements, micronutrient requirements, or specific micronutrients which which change. So, yeah. Um, it is such an interesting time because, you know, in Canada, ice hockey, you get a kid who's 13 or 14 that's, you know, five foot 10, six feet tall almost and weighs 180 pounds. And you have another 12 or 13 year old that's 60 pounds lighter or, or you know, six inches shorter. And so there's, there's just all these various things happening. Um, you know, in, in your work that you, you mentioned and you're doing your PhD around trying to quantify, you know, things like metabolic rate in, in younger athletes, can you, you know, walk us through how you set that up in, in, in your PhD and some of the key insights. Yeah, so I, uh, the, fir- the first study, that, I mean, my, as I said, my PhD was looking at energy requirements, so energy requirements as a whole within um, academy, Premier League uh, academy footballers. Yep. And what we wanted to do was, first of all, establish what the basal energy requirements were mm-hmm. uh, and then, you know, look at the, the other components thereafter. So, in the first study, we, we looked at um, body composition and resting metabolic rate in, in cross-sectional fashion um, in players from the under-12s age group to, to the under-23, so right across that, that academy pathway. And, and I think most importantly is we captured them at different stages of, of growth and maturation. Um, and for people who are watching in the U.S. and North America, how many, how many categories is there in an academy football in the U.K.? Yeah, no, I think yeah, it's a good point. And maybe before we get into the discussion, I think contextualizing what, what the academy is it would be a good starting place. Um, so like like a lot of professional sports, um, football clubs in England and across Europe and the rest of the world have these talent development programs, so academies. And the academy setup is, is, is governed almost by the Premier League. And in, in 2012, the Premier League and, and in collaboration with the professional clubs and academies, um, set up something called the EPPP, which is the uh, Elite Player Performance um, Pathway. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was you know, a collaborative um, frame, framework and strategy, I suppose, set up between clubs and, and the Premier League and the, the Football League. Um, and that's a strategy that aims to develop players you know, technically, tactically, from a coaching point of view, physically, from a sports science and medicine point of view, and then you know, psychosocially as well. So you're really trying to develop these players as they progress um, through the pathway. And I guess what the EPPP did was set out minimum standards. Um, so for a professional academy to be given a category status, so i.e. category one being the best, down to category four, um, the worst or, or not as good as category one, two, or three. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, the least best. <laughs> yeah, the least best. They have to adhere to certain criteria. Um, and, you know, they're judged on many, many different things. Um, finances, vision strategy, management and, and structure, staffing, coaching programs, sports science and medicine programs, uh, recruitment facilities. So there's a whole host of, of things that come into this category status. And that's independently done every couple of years. Um, so there's there's lots of staff and you know within each different discipline and, and I guess over the last sort of five years 
in, in sports science and medicine, there's been a, an increase in the academy nutritionist, be that a, on a part-time or, or a full-time basis. Um, you know, obviously, because there's more and more investment, more and, mon- more and more money being spent on these players and, and investing and developing these players. And, and there's more research coming out to show that, you know, nutrition is a key, key aspect of this. 100%. Um, so, so within the academy setups, I guess formal registration in some clubs would be nine years of age or, or under nines. In some clubs, it might start at under 12, but let's say nine, somewhere between nine and 12, and then that will progress up to under 23s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and after that, it's senior professional um, levels. So, so if we take a, an example week and, and day, at under 12, um, say 12 to 16, they probably train four different days. They probably have one match day and maybe two days off in the week. Okay. Um, so it's a pretty busy schedule. Absolutely. And, and if we then take a training day, they so they will generally go to school with, with the other kids. They'll come out of school maybe two o'clock, a couple of hours early. They'll do pitch-based training. They might do some gym or yoga They'll then maybe do some ed- extra education. They might do some video analysis. So, so it could be a 12-hour day for some of these kids, you know, a working day, if you like. Yeah. And then some of the kids will travel one hour there and one hour back. So, you know, for some, it could be 14-hour days. And, you know, that poses great difficulties and challenges for... Just getting enough fuel in, right? Fuel in and, and all that, yeah. So that's, that's the academy system, really, in a nutshell. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's uh, obviously with, with basketball and, and different sports in North America, we think baseball, American football, um, you know, a bit, bit different system and it doesn't quite gear up at that age. So it's really fascinating to see just at the level at which, you know, at such a young age, that commitment, although we're seeing it more now with basketball, but that commitment that's really uh, being set up there around, you know, the, the, the full on days, like you mentioned, 12, 14 hours and plus plus uh, commuting. Yeah, 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 it's crazy. So yeah, walk us through uh, in terms of when we talk about, you know, trying to assess, you know, in terms of laying out a nutrition plan and trying to assess, you know, what are things like resting metabolic rate equations for 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 younger athletes? Yeah, so I guess if we look at um, an athlete's energy requirements, you know, that they're primarily driven by their their total energy expenditure, um, which we can break down into three different subcomponents. So we've got first of all the, the resting metabolic rate. Um, we've then got the thermic effect of food or diet-induced thermogenesis, and then with this activity energy expenditure, which is highly variable, um, you know, from individual to individual. And, and obviously, we know that body composition, and in particular fat-free mass, is, is closely related to uh, resting metabolic rate. So what we did was assess body composition um, via DEXA and resting metabolic rate via indirect calorimetry. Um, across the academy from under 12s up to under 23s. What we then wanted to do was look at measured resting metabolic rate compared to estimated resting metabolic rate from a number of different prediction equations um, that were commonly used both, you know, common in the literature, but, you know, common, commonly used within applied practice as well. And we selected five different prediction equations um, because they fitted one, what at least one um, of our two predetermined criteria. So, a they were developed within the age range that we were looking at. So you know across those adolescent years, which we thought was important, and b they were at least sort of healthy, active individuals. So we didn't use obese populations or you know, you know disease um, populations. Yep. So had to be healthy and fit and active and and within the years. Um, so, you know, as you'd expect, uh, there was increases in stature and, and body mass as they progressed through um, the, the pathway. For sure. And, and the, the, actually, the, the increases in body mass were primarily driven from increases in fat-free mass, so i.e. muscle and, and organs. Yeah. Uh, and actually, we found that there was no no change in absolute fat mass across the age groups, which was interesting. Wow, yeah. So fat-free mass increased, no change in, in fat mass, which meant that percent body fat then, you know, decreased as they progressed. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
And it, similarly, in accordance with the increase in, in fat-free mass, there was also an increase in, in resting metabolic rate um, as they progress, as they got bigger and, and progress through the academy pathway. Um, and again, not surprising given that you know we know fat-free mass is, is the most metabolically active um, compartment. Mm-hmm. So, so when we then compared the measured um, values for, for resting metabolic rate against the predicted values, we concluded that at least in, in the equations that we used and in our populations, they were inappropriate to use. Um, and, and generally, they underestimated uh, resting metabolic rate. Um, and, and in some cases, as much as 850 kilocalories per day. Wow. I mean, that's a pretty big insight when we think about practitioners and, and coaches using these equations to be able to estimate, okay, my athlete's going to need this much fuel, my young athlete's going to need X amount of calories, and now all of a sudden we put it to the test, we have the lab actually testing, we have a measured up against these equations, and then you guys are uncovering that actually we're really underestimating here, and as you mentioned, I mean, up to what, 800 calories, is it? You know, which is, you know, two sort of small, very large meal for an individual. And, you know, as you say, if you're, if you as a practitioner are basing some of your energy prescription um, calculations off these, these um, prediction equations, you could be, you could be in a whole series of whole host of problems, you know, that coming, coming back to the, the topical low energy availability and, and red S relative energy deficiency in sports, you know, if you're underestimating and underfueling by say 150 calories day on day, week on week, month on month, you, that can lead to a whole host of you know health and, and performance implications. Absolutely, and in, in your time and experience, you know what are some of the symptoms that might come up in in kind of youth or academy athletes, or I mean any athletes for that matter, but for this conversation that that you know again coaches or practitioners might sometimes miss if they're not realizing that they could be out by quite a few calories in terms of the amount of fuel these athletes are needing? Um, I, th- I think that the, the, the broadly you know, can divide them into health health implications and, and performance implications. I think you know there's a whole host of different health and performance implications, but I think some of the ones that are more pertinent to the youth um, athlete and particularly the, the growing and developing athletes, um, we can see a stunting of growth. Um, so, you know, a failure to reach potential adult height, yep. delayed maturation, but predominantly delayed sexual maturation. Um, and in females, that could be the delayed onset of menstruation. Mm-hmm. Um, or bone mineral density in, in some of these athletes. Um, you, uh, here and now, so an increased risk, risk of fracture now. Um, but that could also lead a lower bone mineral density, you know, failure to reach a, a better or a, a peak bone mass, you know, they'd be a reduced peak bone mass, yeah. which could, could lead to problems, you know, down the road, 30, right? 50 years down the line. So, you know, here and now problems, but, but down the line. And also a pet impaired immune system, you know, getting sniffles and colds and coughs frequently. Yeah, that's a big one, that frequent colds, coughs, you know, run down. Um, yeah. It's one that we, we, I mean, we know young athletes are logging in those long hours, as you mentioned, and they're, they're training hard, but that's definitely one that, that can creep up along with some of those other, you know, persistent fatigue and things that, that can should start to set off some some red uh, red flags for you know for coaches again. Yeah, and then I think so for some of the you know um, performance implications, you know, there's loads of different physical performance, endurance, strength, power reductions, but you know even things like as you alluded to, concentration and mood swings and irritability, mm-hmm. and those kind of things. You know that that can affect not just their sport, but school and home life and friendships and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, there's, there's a whole host of different uh, implications of, of Red S that are particularly pertinent to the, to the youth athlete. 100%. It's amazing how even sometimes coaches or practitioners can get too, you know, almost too granular in looking at these individual buckets of, of potentially, you know, various micronutrients when that, that really big signal that, that total energy intake is just not being met. And that's, that's job one. I mean, we got to get that sorted out before we start mining these, these more. And of course we tend to take care of a lot of the, the micronutrient issues when we do, you know, achieve that energy intake. Yeah, certainly. And Marcus, when we look at, again, you know, young athletes aren't many adults. When we look at differences between young athletes and adults, 
you know, from a physiological standpoint, what are some of the big things that stand out that then again, start to inform how a nutrition protocol is going to be different for a, a youth athlete versus you know, an adult athlete? Yeah. So I, I guess probably the, probably the biggest thing is just the size differences. Um, you, you know, the youth athlete is, is um, smaller individual, um, of course. But then if we look at some of the physiological and metabolic, you know, there's a whole host of different, um, they have different um, thermoregulation mechanisms, the youth athletes, which again develop and mature as, as the individual develops and matures. So, you know, they, they don't sweat as much. They, they lose, uh, sorry, this is a youth athlete or predict, particularly a, a prepubertal athlete. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they dissipate heat um, in, in different in different ways to an adult and, and those change throughout growth and maturation. Um, again, pre-pubertal and, and circuit-pubertal um, athletes have reduced glycolytic capabilities, so they predominantly use more fat as a, as a substrate um, mm-hmm. therefore have higher rates of you know, aerobic um, metabolism. Um, so, that, so there are some of, some of the, the different physiological and metabolic differences. Um, yeah, between, I think that one... Yeah, the reduced glycogen capacity is definitely one that, uh, you know, is such a stark contrast to, to adults and even older, um, you know, t- later teens and early 20s. And, and one that, again, if from a youth level, we obviously have a lot of coaches and practitioners. And if it's recreational elite sport that are giving recommendations that don't have some of this background. And so it's, it's important a distinction for them to be able to to know those sort of differences. And Yeah, certainly. And, you know, if you look at your from say team sport or your endurance sport, your classical, you know, carbohydrate loading. You know, we we know these youth athletes don't have the capability or capacity to store this glycogen in the same fashion that adults do, even even in relative terms. So, you know, probably not appropriate to carbohydrate load some of these <laughs> for sure. People, um, or, or those in and around um, puberty. And Marcus, you know, with the value then of drip feeding and carbohydrate, I mean if there's an increased reliance on exogenous carbohydrates in these youth athletes do we need to make sure that we're kind of slowly and steadily drip feeding this in throughout the day yeah i mean certainly certainly during exercise uh, as you've alluded to um greater reliance on, on exogenous so consumed carbohydrate not not stored endogenous carbohydrate um so i think you know certainly in sort of moderate to high intensity exercise of any decent duration, you know, 60 minutes plus, which probably goes against what, you know, a, a lot of the, the general population um, guidelines are. But, you know, for, for these sort of youth athletes, let's call them, yeah, I think there's, there's certainly um, the evidence would suggest. It's such a hard topic, isn't it, for, for, for parents to kind of, in their minds, we think of general health and general population and what we would do for clients who are trying to lose 20 or 30 pounds or all the messaging that we get and around that. And of course, you know, with a youth athlete and with athletes in general, the, the rules of the game are a little bit different. And so, you know, as you mentioned there, it's, it can be a struggle for, for coaches or parents to sort of be able to view things in that lens, do you find? Certainly. And, and I think that's where, you know, you as a practitioner working with, with youth athletes, of course, you have to educate the athlete himself, but um, particularly when you're working with the youth athlete, parents, it's it's as important to educate the parents or mm-hmm. guardians of those individuals because you know you know let's face the facts, those probably from from under sixteen or even under eighteen, the parents really dictate what's put what's put in the shopping basket, what's cooked, what's put in front of them, you know, in terms of types of food, amounts of food, so. You know, the, the parents really need the education as much as the, the, the youth athlete. Absolutely. You probably extend that up to under 23 even. <laughs> it's a lot of, uh, you know, it's a lot of, uh, yeah, the meals are being cooked at home and uh, we got to get the whole family on board and just be seeing things in a little bit different way, especially if mom and dad might be struggling with the various health conditions because it is almost eating opposite to the recommendations that they might be given. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Awesome. So in terms of, you know, we've got the resting metabolic rate piece here. Um, you know, what about your work with energy expenditure and, and some of the targets for fueling for, for youth athletes? So what, what we did then was after we looked at the rest of metabolic rate, so that, that first big component of, of um, energy expenditure, we then wanted to look at total energy expenditure. So the, the three components of 
of uh, total energy expenditure. So we we assess that um, across three different age groups. Um, so an under 12s and 13s age group, an under 15s age group, and an under 18s age group. Uh, and we did that because there were those three age groups were distinctly different stages of growth and maturation. For sure. Um, and we assessed uh, total energy expenditure via doubly labelled water, which is the gold standard technique um, for assessing total energy expenditure in, in free living conditions. Mm-hmm. Um, so it didn't interfere with training or competition or school, you know, that, it's, it's, a, it's a good method for that. Um, so we assessed that over a 14-day in-season period. We, we also assessed energy intake as well um, at the same time just to see where they're actually meeting what they should be um, doing, you know, where they're meet, meeting their energy requirements. Um, and so if we, if we first look at the expenditure data, the, the under 18, so they were 16, 17-year-old players, they were spending on average about 3,600 kilocalories per day. Wow. Now, what, what was interesting um, was actually the range of values across all the age groups. Um, but in, in some some players in the under 18s, they were expending five, up to 5,100 kilocalories per day on average. Wow, that's covered a lot of miles. Um, the, the, the under 15s were expending in and around 3,000 kilocalories per day. And then the 12s, 13s group were around 2,900 kilocalories per day. But but as I say, you know, there's huge individual variation between players, even within the same age group. But, you know, as I said, 5,100 kilocalories per day in one of the players. And when you then try to translate that into food, what we should be doing, like, that's a lot of food. It's a full-time job just eating that much food. Yeah, certainly. And then, and then if, you can t- if we contextualize that data can, to um, Liam Anderson, who, who's done some some great work, um, and he, he did this uh, the similar study within adult Premier League players, professional adult uh, Premier League players at, at Liverpool Football Club, and the the under eighteen values were similar to the the adult values as as a mean, but obviously the, the five thousand one hundred kilocalories was was higher than the adults in that case, and uh, clubs in the the Dutch top division. Um, and again, the, the expenditures in the under 18s were, were, were higher than our adult values. So when, when you actually start to think about that, right, these kids are, are growing and maturing. They've got the busy schedules from a school point of view, and then they train later in the day, you know, and then you're thinking of the feeding of them. Like, it's crazy. It's, it's, it's really, you know, people. some people might, might say they're not that high compared to some of the endurance sports and stuff, but when you actually think about putting it together and then delivering that in terms of food and, and meeting that in terms of energy requirements. It's in, in the context of the schedule as well. It's, it's a lot. Yeah. I mean, it's massive. And even just, again, the, the, the portability, the convenience of it all of being able to carry all this around and get access to it. I mean, it, those are the little things that obviously, you know, you go through with your athletes, but it's something that when you, when it, a parent or a coach or someone starts to think about this, it's like, you know, you need a, you need a full, backpack or fridge on your back just to get through a day for a young athlete who's going around doing all these things otherwise you're going to fall pretty short of the requirements and back to your point around you know we need to fuel with some of these things that in the general population we might think is far too much fuel or too much sugar or whatnot it may be but again with this you know massive energy expenditures we you've got to find a way to be able to get that fuel in right yeah certainly and, and i guess it's one of the that's, you know one of the differences between Say we look at a, a Premier League adult player compared to an academy player. You know, the, the full-time senior players—that's that, really their sole focus. You know, this is their job, and you know, train and recover and fuel and you know all that kind of stuff. Mm. These youth athletes—they have the growth and operation aspect and element. But they also have these school schedules. So when, then, as you say, when you look at actually, you can't feed them for a lot of days. They're in school and class. They can't be eaten training you know so you have to be really quite tactical about what you're giving them and, and when you're giving them and it, uh, you know that, that suits them and their schedule yeah 100 percent. i mean it really is becomes 
highly tactical, what's portable, what's easily accessible, trying to find the things that actually fit the the macros that you're after. Um, not not always easy, is it? Not always, no. Yeah. And, I, and I, I'm one of the, you know, the professional academies within the UK and you know, Premier League academies, they're, they're generally pretty well funded. But, you know, if you then start to look outside, you know, similar or youth athletes, um, you know, with similar training and competition demands, but in, in sports that are less funded, you know, they're then having to front all that, that themselves. You know, we, from a nutrition provision point of view, in a lot of these Premier League academies, they're, they're quite fortunate. You know, they, they get given one to two meals a day from the club, but, you know, that's not always the case in, in other sports. So, yeah, it certainly, certainly um, needs, needs time and thought. <laughs> And, and when looking at some of those younger age groups, uh, Marcus, you know, the under 12s, under 15s, what were some of those, um, you know, we're looking at fueling, what were some of the numbers that we, you guys ended up uh, uncovering with, with how many, yeah, how many calories per day are we looking at, how many you know, grams of carbohydrate, protein, et cetera? Yeah, so, so within the uh, under 15s, we were in around 3,000 calories per day, and the 12s and 13s was about... 2,900 kilocalories per day with, you know, a range of values probably from 2,300 up towards 4,000 within those two age groups. Mm-hmm. So I guess, then, you know, when we, when we tried to then work out macronutrients um, or sort of proposed, we, in that paper that, that we published in, in MedSci there, we proposed some macronutrient recommendations based on the expenditure values that, that we found. Um, and, you know, there are probably six to 10 grams per kilo of carbs around, you know, 1.5 to 2 grams per kilo of, of protein and then fat to make up the rest of that. So, you know, somewhere between 30 and 35 percent of your energy intake or, or around 1.5 grams per kilo. Um, but again, I think before before you can start given macronutrient recommendations, I think, you know, for any athlete, not just youth athlete, it's important to first of all understand the, the energy expenditures and the energy requirements and then, you know, fit your macronutrient requirements to that. Absolutely. I mean, it's so, so crucial. And, um, you know, can you talk a bit about even the value of meal frequency? If we do, once we understand some of the, the energy expenditure piece and how much fuel we need, you know, to be able to achieve that, you know, how important is kind of establishing a certain meal frequency if we are trying to achieve kind of these these really big numbers in terms of fueling i guess from a from a practical point of view i think that one of the things certainly in the youth athletes that i've worked with you actually need to look at what are the opportunities in the day that can actually because you know let's just take it an example um day so they might have breakfast at home they then go to school and they're in lessons for you know two or three hours so they actually can't eat during that period of time which, which falls quite nicely. They might have a mid-morning break, another couple of hours lessons, have a lunch, a um, couple more hours lessons potentially, then we, we would feed them. Um, well, in, in our context at, at Everton Academy, we'd feed them. So before training, they would then train and we'd feed them again after. So they, they were probably eating five to six times a day, um, generally, you know, and, and, you know, if you come back and look at some of the, sort of the protein literature, I guess, that's sort of what you want in terms of, you know, spacing throughout the day every three or four hours. So, yeah, I reckon most of the the youth players were eating five or six times a day. That's if they were eating their breakfast at home and, you know, eating their eating all their meals. Yeah, I mean, it's so, so crucial to establish, and as you mentioned, it does flow naturally into a day, um, but it is always amazing how young athletes can miss snacks or something's not packed or this one gets skipped. And, and so it's, yeah, just reinforcing that, as you say, it's just so key to be able to you, know, you get those five or six feeding opportunities and really maximizing those. So you can actually hit some of those numbers that you're, that you're looking at. Yeah. I think, I think probably for, for youth athletes, uh, breakfast is certainly one that you, we had, we had to do a lot of education on because typically they, they look, they want those extra 10, 15 minutes um, in the morning so a lot of my education, particularly with the, the parents, was you know quick, easy breakfast solutions that provided enough energy and, and macronutrients and, and fluids and whatnot. So um, yeah, breakfast is probably the one that 
particularly in the younger age groups, um, that had to fend for themselves. <clears throat> Some of the older age groups from under 18 and 23, they would have got fed within the academy and, and in the training ground. But the younger ones who had to provide and, and, and sort out themselves for breakfast, you know, they were typically the ones that, that missed it. Um, and then again, we, we, <clears throat> we framed the environment. So when they come in um, from school to the training ground, you know, we, at their um, changing room, we set up, what we what we termed a pit stop so we had food and fuel available for them and then when they come back come back in from the pitch they went then went up to to the canteen and restaurants and, ha- and had a buffet style meal so again you know it, it as i said we were well well provided they were well provided for yeah i mean a couple great points there i mean the first with breakfast i mean it is great to be able to make it simple and easy and doable for especially youth athletes and parents to try to bridge that gap. I mean, if they're barely eating much at breakfast to, to kind of cook up the hot breakfast to that, that transition can be a big jump for a lot of folks. So, so getting into the, you know, whatever's convenient, whatever's quick, whatever's easy, so important. And then, you know, love the, the, the pit stop uh, availability of just being able to yeah, grab, grab, you know, key, key fueling, um, you know, on the way into the, into the training ground. And then, Again, another another meal a day taken care of. So really, really great work there. And 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 Marcus, anything else with with your work there before, uh, before we kind of shift gears into some of your current work today around some of those studies on on athlete fueling and resting metabolic rate? No, I mean I think that covers some of the main stuff. You know, we 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 also look at some training and match load and, and how that changes across the age groups and how training and match load is periodized throughout the week. Um, in different age groups, and then the implications of that for for um, energy expenditure and subsequent energy intake. But yeah, that, that that that's currently not not yet published. But you know that covers really most of the, the research that I I've, I've done thus far on on um, academy uh, football nutrition. Fantastic! And if we uh, kind of segue into your you know your current role with Aston Villa in the Premier League, you know working with the men's team? Are you working all the way down through the academy as well? Or is it, um, you know, just with the, just with the senior team? And, and what's that experience been like uh, in year one? Uh, I was brought in as, as, as the head of nutrition. Um, so Aston Villa nutrition support, um, you know, a day or a couple of days a month um, over the last couple of years. But um, there was a new performance director come in uh, probably about a year before I did he he decided that the 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 club wanted a nutrition department. So yeah, I come in as the head of of nutrition and predominantly working with the, the men's senior team. Um, but we we've recently just brought in um, Ruben Stables, who who's going to look after the academy setup as well. Um, yeah, so we're growing the department there, and you know we we will down the line provide service to the men's first team the academy and the women's teams as well um so yeah the, you know it's as i said i only joined january january this year we had covid and lockdown in the middle of that, so. has a worldwide pandemic for year one yeah it's it's been a, a strange start to a job but no it's great um and you know, it, it's it's a similar it's similar to, to what I walked into at Everton. Um, it's a, it's a blank canvas, a blank page. So set up things how I, how I want to run them and, and set them up and roll them out. And yeah, it's awesome. So far, so good. Fantastic. I and mean, without giving away any trade secrets, can you tell us a little bit about some of the insights there and, and the initial weeks and months and and you know maybe some of the nuances when you get into the you know the top flight in the men's team in the EPL. Yeah, so so Aston Villa, um, are, you know, they're a big traditional English football club. Um, but they last year they were recently promoted back up to the Premier League. They spent a couple of years down in the the Championship, so the second tier. Um, so I think when I I came in, one of the first things I noticed was they were they were probably still operating at not Championship level, but some of the staffing structures weren't set up to to Premier League level. So just as an example, um, our, our catering team had five full-time members of staff. Um, I, I, and the demand on them for men's academy and women's was, was through the roof and they were doing crazy hours. So I guess one of the, one of the first big things that, that I changed and 
and um, we managed to get across the line there a couple of weeks ago was was double the size of the the catering team um, so we've managed to get new staff in and um, you know that really enables us to then kick on from and, and integrate the nutrition service into that the catering and, and restaurant side of things and um, because up until then we were struggling because they were coming in and we, we couldn't get any time to to, to educate them or, or do menu development and that kind of stuff so I guess that was that was one of the first big things we've we've done and then, and then second of all was <clears throat> get in Ruben uh, for the academy so we can now you know extend that nutrition service down through the academy pathway and we'll have a top to bottom approach um, and then yeah the, the nutrition roles obviously you know the day to day is pretty much uh, as you'd expect for sure, and I mean that's such an intricate, uh, you know, so it's such an important connection, isn't it, between the, you know, the kitchen staff, the chefs, and then you know, the delivery of the nutrition. And you know, can you talk a little bit about that, you know, that relationship between those chefs and the performance staff, and and how important that is to being able to deliver what you want to deliver? Yeah, it's it's so vital. You know, um, we as we as the nutritionists generally you know we bring the science we've, we've come through and a science education can bring the science but a lot of the time <coughs> sorry a lot of the time you know myself included you know we're not chefs and um, we don't know really how to bring that to life so for me it's a, that relationship's key <coughs> i bring the science or the nutrition practitioner brings the science the chef brings the the art if you want you know the science and the art and really it's about merging the two of them um and uh, and ultimately delivering the food because you know if the food if the food isn't um appealing to the athlete you know visually aesthetically taste you know it's just you know you, there's, they're not going to eat it you're you're off on the wrong food so you really need to integrate them well and does that become a challenge when you you know obviously in football you've got players from all the various different nationalities all around the world you know trying to cater to everybody's taste how is how is that uh challenge and then in professional football um you know we have players from we have players from south america from argentina from brazil we have quite a few african players north african players egyptian lads um you know lads from from Burkina Faso, from tanzania so you know we have a whole host of of different nationalities and cultures and they have to be catered for and um, that's probably been one of the challenges for me you know trying to get different little bits of you know the, the african lads love jollof rice and you know trying to get, get some of those recipe menu um, so yeah I, I think you just have to spend time and have a two-way relationship with the with the athlete you know get their feedback and what they like and what they would like to see and what they don't and then, and then we have certain athletes that do ramadan as well again that's been another cultural learning experience for me and um, you know learning about that and, they have around their religion and how that can influence their training and, and nutrition as well so yeah that's a whole separate podcast isn't it the uh, all the implications involved with uh with that yeah listen marcus i really appreciate you uh carving out some time here today uh you know sharing your insights your research you know if, if you, you know, if we look at kind of the future of performance and performance nutrition in football again without getting out of any trade secrets here what, what are some of the areas that you feel are going to be uh, some areas of impact in the next five or ten years. Million dollar question. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, I think I think what we will see in the next couple of years, you know, there's a lot more female research going on. Um, so I think some of the, I think what we will see is some of the the, the male studies or male population studies repeated in, in female populations. I think there'll be quite a lot of work coming out in that area. I think actually, you know, we have quite not a lot of knowledge in in, in football and football nutrition and you know uefa actually just recently published a new consensus statement yeah. there and um, so for me it's actually about the delivery of some of this i think you know right we know this is it is it being delivered and implemented day to day and i, I think there's there's work to be done in that area and um, from both the research and a, an applied practice point of view yeah yeah knowing is one thing and applying it and being able to deliver it and getting the athletes on board and all that that piece is such a huge huge part of the whole story isn't it yeah certainly certainly awesome marcus listen i appreciate you carving out some time if people want to keep up with uh connect with you or keep up with your work where's the best place to connect with you um yeah so i'll 
uh, you know, I'm moder moderately active on, on Twitter and I'll, sh I'll share my research uh, on it. Um, so my handle is at Marcus Hannon 92. Uh, I also have research gate where I, where I post all my research as well. So people can, can find my research there. Um, and, and if people want to uh, reach out and drop me a line, I'm more than happy to, to have a chat. Awesome. Listen, we'll include those links, Marcus, in the, in the show notes. And again, really appreciate you taking the time today. Yeah, thanks very much, Mark.